So, you've learned a little bit about the disc and what can take place in the aspect of you having some components of having the differentiation between a normal disc and it having something that's like a protrusion, i.e. it's coming back and it's pushing against the cord or it's punch, pushing against the nerve root. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how to be able to potentially treat that. And initially, the thing that we're going to do almost as a, a, as a given is for you to receive an oral steroid, which you're going to take for about five to seven days or so. The benefit behind it is that it's fairly cheap, it's sometimes effective, and you don't have to undergo a procedure or any aspect of a surgery. And you may be able to get um, some degree of relief within the first three days. The downsides to being able to uh, utilize an oral steroid is that it typically is going to, if you're diabetic, cause your blood sugar to bump up a little bit, but that can be treated and is done all the time. It also can cause you to have a little bit of fluid gain in your legs. So if you have a condition such as congestive heart failure, we just need to watch and be, uh, pay attention to it and closely monitor it a little bit more. But when we have you return back after a week of starting that oral steroid, about anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of patients don't necessarily get a response. So the next step is for us to treat with more of an injection type um, therapy. And so most patients that I have that come see me will say something to the effect of, I've had shots before, those shots don't work, don't talk to me about shots, I want something that's more extreme or nothing at all. Now the thing that I will say to you is, after that commentary is, what shot did you have? And I think that's pretty darn important because it gives us an idea of how it's going to treat your pathology, meaning the disease that you have, how close it is to the area that you have a problem with, and in what way they did it, because that can really influence how that medication is able to reach the spot that we're interested in. So, for instance, as you know already about disc bulges, they can be either right in the center, or they can be a little bit off to the side and catching that nerve root. So how we give medication can dictate how close it's going to be to that underlying problem. So there's three different types of epidurals. Most people have heard of an epidural before. Um, they initially think, oh my gosh, this is going to be a shot that's going to go into my spine and specifically my spinal cord. And that's not really quite true. It is going to be a shot, or rather an injection, that's going to be present in the aspect of the back. However, it's not going to be something that's going to go directly into your spinal cord. That's not going to be what we're looking to do. What we're looking to do is to actually give medicine in and around the area that's close to not so much the spinal cord, but close to the tissues that influence that spinal cord and that compress it in some way. Whether it's a disc, as we referred to before, whether it's coming from aspects of surrounding tissue, whether it's coming from ligaments that are present that are larger in size that are causing a compressive aspect or stenosis that we talked about before. So, as I alluded to, there's three different types of epidurals. The first of which is an epidural that's called a translaminar epidural or interlaminar epidural. That type of epidural is the same type of epidural that you would get for surgery or that you would have for labor and delivery for um, having, um, uh, prior to having childbirth. Okay? The anesthesiologist typically would come in and they'd place a needle sort of in this orientation and they can feel when they're getting to the right spot and when they finally get to the right spot they have a syringe that's attached to that needle that has a negative pressure. In other words, it's like a vacuum that sucks in fluid or air and lets us know when to stop. And that area is outside the spinal cord. I'm going to repeat that again. That area is outside the spinal cord. And it allows for medication to be dispensed in that area in that region and it then traverses or crosses over to the areas that we're really interested in. Sometimes it's components of the nerve. Frequently for us dealing with pain, it's dealing with the aspect of the disc. So that's a translaminar approach, meaning these are the lamina and these areas here, and we're basically going in between that area so it's right in the middle. This is probably not going to be a procedure that you're going to encounter as your very first injection if this is the thing that we're um, as a starting point for us. And there's a few reasons why, which I'll address in a, little bit in a little bit later aspect of our discussion. But at the moment, this is our starting point because this injection is the same thing that we would do in the lumbar region as shown in my model here. Or if we were to transition to a different area and region of the spine, if we were to use this big guy here. If you recall, we talked about before, there's the lumbar spine, there's the thoracic spine, 
and then there's a cervical spine. And if we're giving you injections outside of the lumbar spine, for the most part, it's always going to be a translaminar procedure. And if I was testing you right now, which hopefully you can recall so you can be able to get 100%, get that star on the paper, this is a translaminar approach because it's coming right in the middle. All right? It's the same thing if we we're doing it in the cervical region. We're basically going to place that needle in orientation to the same way as my Q-tip is in this aspect. And we're going to use not only that negative pressure or that vacuum that I talked to you about before, but we're going to use the context of using the x-ray machine while we're doing this. And that x-ray machine is going to tell us a couple different things. Number one, it's going to tell us whether our needle is straight on or whether it's off to the side or off to another side, which would be pretty important based on whether you have pain that's to the left or the right side. That's the first thing. And so we're going to use it in this orientation, as you can see. And secondarily, we're going to flip that x-ray machine and we're going to look at it from the side so we can see how deep our needle is, which is really what is most concerning to, mo to the vast majority of my patients. They say, well, how do you know how deep you are? Well, we can be able to see that on x-ray. And that's the main, one of the main reasons why we're using the x-ray, so we can be able to have an idea of what our safety level happens to be. So that's the aspect of a translaminar or interlaminar injection. And the cervical region is pretty much always going to be in that orientation where you kind of see it. It's going to be right in between the aspect of the bone. And in the thoracic region, it's going to be a similar type thing. And the lumbar region, however, down here in the low back, we're a lot more fancy. There's a whole host of other things that we can do. I'm going to switch models for a second because these aspects of the bone sometimes can get in the way and not let you see everything that it is that I want you to see. So we're going to switch to a little bit of a smaller model and talk about some of the other types of epidurals. All right, so as I alluded to before, the thing that I told you is that there's a translaminar approach, the same way as it would be right here in the middle, okay? That's one way to be able to do an epidural. A second way to be able to do an epidural is something that's called a transforaminal approach. So if you take a look at this model right here, you can see there's the bone, there's a bone, there's a disc in between, and there's a little bulge right here that's red and inflamed and it's probably pressing up against the nerve root. We want to be able to get as close to that area as we possibly can. So there's a way for us to use that x-ray to come here and place a needle just like this in this orientation. And so what is this approach called? It's called a transforaminal approach. Foramina from the Latin for window is what we're going to look to see if we can place medication in this area, not to stick the nerve per se, and not to certainly stick the spinal cord, but so we can give medication into this region and then have it traverse or cross near that area that is so it's going to influence the disc and influence that nerve root so that we can try to get an improvement in that area. So that's the second type of epidural that's, uh, that's able to be utilized. The third type is a type that's called a caudal. And most people would say, well, what the heck is that? It's actually an injection that's going to be done in the low, low back, down in this area, in this region in here. If you were actually seeing it on a live uh, person, it would be in between the, the cleft of their buttocks. That's where we're going to be placing this. And most people say, well, that's got to be painful. I, well, I don't know if I would want something like that. Well, actually, this is the way that epidurals are administered to neonates and to infants when they're first born, when they need to have surgery immediately after being born or sometime within the first aspects of six months or so. So the reason why we're going to potentially utilize this for you having pain is because it can be able to allow us not only to target this area, but it allows us to be able to target multiple areas through the use of a small thin tube called a catheter. So if I was to kind of replicate that, in essence, it would be something to the effect of a small tube that we utilize to go up into that area after having a needle in the place that we run that tube through. So that's what we're looking to be able to do, is to place that catheter. And most people would say, well, my gosh, how, hard, how, how painful is that catheter going to be? The catheter itself is soft. It's flexible. That, and the reason why we're using that catheter is so we can give you medicine at more than one spot without me having to use an, a needle at each one of those spots. So in fact, it's probably going to be something that's going to be a lot more comfortable than us choosing another alternative to go after it. And so then what I get in, as my subsequent question would be, well, what type of medications are you given with all these different types of epidurals? Is it just a local anesthetic? Is it just a steroid? Is it a temporary fix? How does it work? So, quite frankly, most of the time the medications that we're going to use is a mixture of a steroid and it's a local anesthetic. And the reason why is the steroid 
hopefully is going to take that inflammation and decrease it, whether it's coming from the disc, whether it's coming from the ligament, whether it's coming from other soft tissues that surround that area that's compressive in nature. But it's going to take a little bit of time before we see a response. The response is going to typically take place after about 72 hours, give or take. So during that first 48-hour period, you want to take and have a conservative care you want to be at home, you want to kind of do some bed rest, you want to read a book, you want to get pampered by your significant other, have them you know, make you your favorite meal, bring you some ice cream like you had a tonsillectomy or something along those lines. You don't want to do a lot of activity because that steroid has to marinate in there. It has to kind of saturate that tissue and then we're looking to see if that tissue responds. And that's the kicker. The kicker is really whether the tissue is going to respond or not in order for us to be able to determine whether there's going to be some degree of effectiveness or whether it's going to work or not. And so if we're talking about numbers, for the average person, a, a transferaminal epidural, which is that epidural like I talked to you about before that's going to come here, is going to typically be about 60 to 70 percent effective, which means that it's also going to fail in about 40 to 30 percent of people. And so most people say, well, I don't know if I really like those odds. But the question is, if you have pain already, for you to have just a little bit of pain while we're doing that procedure, but having the potential benefit of getting an, an improvement in your pain by a fair amount, it may very well be worth it for you to consider something like that. Additionally, if we do it in one way and it fails, it doesn't mean that we're going to do it the exact same way if we were to do a subsequent procedure. There's a whole host of different ways to be able to combine this to get after what it is that we're targeting. So for instance, if we did a transferaminal in one approach and we got some degree of relief but you had some pain elsewhere, what we may consider doing is placing a subsequent needle in another spot. And so I can show you various different elements of imagery so you can be able to determine that and take a look at that. So for instance, if we showed you a picture, there's a picture right here that demonstrates that various aspect where we have a spine model that's in a lateral view that shows two small thin needles, notice I said small and thin, that are entering into that same aspect in a transferaminal approach at two levels. Now, did we start off with a two-level approach the first time this patient had a procedure? More than likely not. What we saw is that the one needle approach that we tried to utilize wasn't effective and we needed to be a little bit more aggressive and then we were able to see a pretty darn decent response, if not great response. So then the next question I would get is how long of a duration of action does this, is this going to work for? In essence, is this going to be a one-shot, one-and-done type of thing? What I will tell it to you is, quite frankly, I really don't know. There are some times where a patient will get an injection and will have a prolonged length of relief anywhere greater than a year or longer. And there are some times where it just doesn't work at all. And there's a whole myriad of experiences in between where you get some relief for months, you get some relief for weeks. We don't know that until we are actually able to try it. So that's the aspect of looking at it from both either a transferaminal or a caudal and why we might do a mixture thereof. The full details of that I won't be able to give to you until I'm able to talk to you on a personal and individual level. At that point, I'll give you more insight into what's going to be the right thing for you.